I'm Deidre Woolard here today with Scott Rick. Scott Rick is a marketing professor at the University of Michigan's Ross School of Business, where he's won awards for research and teaching. He holds a PhD in behavioral decision research from Carnegie Mellon. His new book, Tightwads and Thentrists, is a fascinating look at the way we the way we spend and how it impacts our relationships. Welcome, Scott. How are you? I'm good. Thanks so much for having me. Well, this book was really fascinating to me. I think I learned a little bit about myself in, in the process, but let's start with the basics. What is a tightwad and how does it compare to someone who maybe is just a little frugal? Yeah. So uh, they will look quite similar on paper often, a, a tightwad and a highly frugal person. But a, a tightwad is someone who often has money to spend um, and they know there are things that would make them and the people around them happier. But the prospect of spending the money makes them very anxious mm. uh, and they just can't make it happen. The thought of spending the money keeps them from buying a lot of the stuff that they realize would be in their best interest. And um, so this can be very frustrating for them and the people around them. Um, it can lead to a lot of internal conflict. Um, and so it's, again, it, it can look good on paper, but it's not always a pleasant internal situation. Whereas a highly frugal person, uh, that's quite different. Uh, frugal people are, they save a lot. They're happy. They believe in saving. They love reusing items until they're just completely worn out. Um, they're not overburdened with a lot of desire for new material objects. Um, so they're just kind of living very conservatively and loving it. And so frugal people tend to be quite happy, whereas tight wads, uh, that's a little trickier. So it sounds like there's some anxiety about about the spending that that sort of defines what a tight wad is. Oh, yes. Um, anxiety, distress, those are kind of the key feelings that keep them from spending what they think they should. Now, on the other side, the flip side, the spendthrift, uh, you know, people think of this as maybe compulsive shopping or, but this is not just someone who doesn't just spend, but it sounds like they, they almost don't think about money at all. So is it the opposite of the, the anxiousness about money? Yeah. Well, it's, you know, the, I think they realize they're not kind of doing what they should be doing. Um, if you ask them like, oh, here's like a fun new product. Um, when do you think you'll get tired of this? they're actually better at knowing when they're going to get tired of something than a tightwad is. They just care less about those future outcomes. They're very present oriented, living in the moment. Um, so they're aware of implications and negative implications of their shopping today. They're just not so constrained by those thoughts, that awareness of what happens later. So they're, they're living in the moment. And, um, you know, where a, a tight wide will, sometimes they don't shop for things that they know they need. Spendthrifts will shop for not only what they need, but also what they might need someday. Like, oh, I'm at the store, I'm buying clothes for work. Oh, there's a fun velvet jacket. That might be fun for a, a fancy party. I'm not invited to such a party, but what if I am someday? I'd love to, I'd rather be looking at it than looking for it, is the, the spendthrift ideology. So in terms of how that works with like a compulsive shopping or hoarding, it sounds like that's, it's, it's slightly different because it doesn't, they don't need to amass as much stuff. They just sort of don't think about it as much. Yeah. So things like uh, compulsive shopping, um, that there's research showing that that is often related to depression and can be treated with um, antidepressants and therapy. And so there is kind of a, a more therapeutic approach to tamping down compulsive shopping. I think hoarding is in that ballpark. Whereas <clears throat> I don't think something like um, an antidepressant would have much of an effect on spendthrifts. It, that's not, it doesn't seem to be what's driving them to spend so much. They just, it's just someone cut the brakes on the car. They, <laughs> they just don't have the, the stop signal so, so good. So it sounds like the spendthrift is, is happier than the tightwad overall? Well, they're both conflicted. That's kind of what they have in common, that they're both kind of torn. Um, there are people in the middle of this distribution. We call them unconflicted consumers. And they, they kind of are in the Goldilocks zone and 
not too little, not too much. And they're kind of happy with what they spend, but it's the two extremes, the tight wads and spin thrifts are both kind of, um, there's a lot of regret there. They're kicking themselves, uh, but for very different reasons. We've got a quiz in the book. I don't want to go through the whole thing, but if you're trying to assess where you might fall on that spectrum, what are some quick questions you can ask yourself? Yeah. Well, it's, uh, you know, imagine you go to the mall and are you kicking yourself afterwards for either not buying something that you thought you should, that's a tight wide um, thought, or are you like, well, I, I probably shouldn't have bought that. That's, that's the spendthrift. And so the scale has questions like that. Who do you relate to more? What perspective? And yeah, I see this in my own life. I'm a spendthrift. I'm married to a tight wide and my wife used to come home and from shopping, what she called shopping, but she would tell me about the things she wished she bought. And I was like, just why didn't you buy the thing? Uh, my goodness, you could use that. And um, so it's um, those kind of regrets is, is what the scale tries to tap into. Well, and on either side, you've got these ways that you can sort of mitigate your own tendencies. Uh, one of the things you talk about in the book is the way that spending has shifted and just the way that it's it's frictionless. There's you talk about this thing that I thought was really interesting called payment salience, which is just this kind of this awareness of the fact that you're spending, even when you're just swiping a card or tapping something on, on your phone. So, so how can you reduce or increase this to kind of mitigate your natural tendencies? Yeah. Well, certainly retailers are doing everything they can to reduce payment salience and they're really <laughs> good at this and they're artists like Amazon. It's amazing. Um, so if you're a tight wide, it's just kind of, you know, putting yourself in those places where you can distract yourself and not kind of pay too much attention to the money leaving your possession. Um, the real challenge is for the spendthrifts. They have to kind of, they're on their own to kind of ramp up payment salience. Um, but it's doable. It's possible. Like when I was in grad school and I had no money, I had to turn myself into a temporary tightwad. So I would pay with cash whenever possible. I would make sure I felt pain at the ATM, reducing my account balance, and then pain at the store when paying with cash, just trying to put up these speed bumps, um, all this friction, like paying attention to the money I was spending. And, we'll, and when I would spend with a card, I would get the receipt, take it home, and go into my Excel file and kind of keep track of uh, each purchase. And that was painful to kind of, um, you know, look at all this money being spent. So I was just trying to ramp up how obvious it was the money leaving my possession and so that's the the challenge for spendthrifts so you, you're kind of on your own um re retailers are not looking to help you <laughs> yes. no, definitely not I, th I think it's interesting that we all have these tendencies and then we sort of have to work against our own nature to get us more to the middle ground yes exactly um but you know we can learn from uh, people trying to influence us. And, you know, I think there are things we can do to influence ourselves, to to reshape how we think about choices and what kind of reminders or speed bumps we put in our own environment so we can kind of uh, become like self-marketers, so to speak. Well, you mentioned that you're the spendthrift, you're married to the tightwad. Uh, I think I might be the tightwad married to the <laughs> spendthrift. And you've done some research on whether or not these these uh, different types are likely to marry. So what did you discover? How does some of this play out? Yeah. <clears throat> Normally, we marry ourselves. We like most things about ourselves, and we look for that in other people. But if there's something we don't like about ourselves, we're not necessarily looking for that in someone else it can really shine a uncomfortable spotlight on the issue. So if I see someone who approaches money the same way I do, and I, and I don't like how I approach money, it's like, ugh, is that what I look like? Is that what I act like? It can really um, be a real turnoff at first. So we find that indeed tight ones and spendthrifts are more likely to marry each other than they are to marry someone like themselves. And we think that's fun at first, um, but there are lots of things that are fun at first that are less fun in a marriage when the decisions are more important, when there are higher stakes. Um, and so it, it is kind of one of these so-called fatal attractions. Um, so like if I'm a shy person, I might find someone really outgoing, like fun and exciting at first, but eventually I do need my quiet time um, and it might get old. 
um, over time. And so this seems to be one of those patterns. So what happens mm -hmm. if the two alike types marry each other? If a, if a tightwad and a tightwad get together, is it, is it just... Is it just a bit grim? And if a spendthrift and a spendthrift get together, do they just bankrupt themselves? <laughs> well, I would say that the two spendthrift pairing is the most dangerous and it can be quite financially explosive. But uh, certainly if they have the money to spend, that could be quite a fun life. But um, that is a very precarious pairing. Now, two tight wads, yeah, if you're just looking to maximize the money in the home, you want to put as many tight wads in the home as possible, for sure. They are usually living a pretty stable, comfortable life. Um, it's not necessarily an exciting one um, or filled with much adventure or novelty um, or kind of fresh experience. Uh, they can work at that, but left to their own devices, it can be a little, uh, you know, not for everyone, let's say, a little quiet. Um, so I do think a mismatched couple has the most potential for happiness because I, I think this balance can work, but it takes some, some effort. Sounds like it may also take some self-awareness too. If you don't know yeah. which side you're on, then the other person's spending attitude can just seem just wrong and stupid. Oh yes. Oh yes. And um, so it's, it's good to kind of, do things like take this scale, the tight wide spendthrift scale, or you know, there are other questionnaires, things to kind of reflect on what you're up to and try to think about what your partner, how they might respond, see if you can guess their responses. Um, but yeah, it's good to know where everyone's coming from. Like I might get a gift from my spouse that seems really cheap and like, oh my God, you don't love me, do you? Um, but I need to keep in mind like, oh, you really find it painful to spend money. Like it's, it's not your feelings about me. It's just your, your nature. It's in you. And, um, it helps me kind of interpret, uh, how you spend and what you think about me. So it's, it's good to keep in mind where everyone's coming from. Well, I think one of the things that's interesting, uh, is that we all have these weird internal rules and, mm -hmm. you know, these, these rules can be very idiosyncratic. And yeah. if, if my rules are different from your rules, that can cause a lot of conflict in relationships. You've got some good stories in the book. You've got some, some kind of funny, crazy ones. What are some <laughs> of the oddest stories you've encountered? Well, I mean, just about any idiosyncratic rule is unlikely to be shared, uh, with a partner and, you know, people have different hobbies and interests and they're unlikely to be understood by a partner who doesn't share that interest. Um, and yeah, what might be perfectly reasonable to one person uh, might seem completely ridiculous to the partner. Um, so yeah, we might have rules about um, what I'll spend on my particular hobby. If like my wife, if she's a needle pointer, I have no knowledge of that world. Occasionally I'll see a price tag and I'll be quite surprised um, to her. That's perfectly reasonable. Uh, and so I say, I don't need to know about that stuff. Um, I just need to have a general sense of what you're up to and vice versa. Uh, but yeah, getting into the details, I think is a recipe for unnecessary trouble. Um, and yeah, people have rules about, Oh no, you can't buy iced tea outside the home. You have to make your own tea. <laughs> um, that's just a waste of money. And it's just, um, a, a recipe for these unnecessary fights. People are convinced like, oh, if you don't have the, the latte or the iced tea, you can, you know, that's how you become rich. And I'm just not sure the math shakes out on that. So, um, people can get arguing over minute things that just don't add up to much of anything. Well, it sounds like when you've got the tightwad and the spendthrift, I would assume that the tightwad necessarily wants to talk about money and wants to like go over the financial budget, see where we're at, see where we need to improve. And that may be torture for, for the spendthrift. So, so what has your research shown about how, is there any guidance that, that you have in terms of how people can approach that? Yeah, well, I will say, yes, it is a bit asymmetric. Like they're both frustrated with each other. The tightwad is more frustrated with the spendthrift. We do mm -hmm. find that. Um, but uh, I think, you know, there are kind of rules of thumb. I would say that one way to kind of 
break the ties about um, we disagree who should win. I think if we're talking about like a material purchase, like a new TV or a fancier car, I would usually try to let the tightwad win on those um, just based on research on what makes us happy over time. And, you know, material goods aren't always great at that. Um, when it comes to experiences, if they disagree, I would say try to let the spendthrift win um, because those are usually what bring more lasting happiness. You get a bigger bang for your buck in terms of happiness for meaningful shared experiences. Um, so like family vacations, uh, things like that. Um, so that can be a rule of thumb. It, it shouldn't always be one person winning. Uh, but I think material versus experiential can be a way to kind of um, set up domains of who should kind of run the show on these kind of things. Well, speaking of running the show, uh, you talk about joint accounts in the book. Uh, I've been in a relationship for uh, two decades. We have never made it to joint accounts, but now ah. we're sort of considering it uh, to a limited ex extent. But yes. what are the some some of the pros and cons, and, and why is that so hard for some people? Yeah, well, I mean, people are getting married later now, and they're having separate accounts, and there's a lot of inertia and status quo bias, and um, you know, it's hard to hard to change. But um, I am a big fan of joint accounts in a in a limited, careful way. Um, you know, one big advantage of joint accounts is like, if you can use it to absorb all the incoming money to the relationship. I, I like them as a tool for psychological money laundering. I want all incoming money to just be our money. Um, I don't like this where it comes into my separate account and I chip into a joint account. It's got to come through joints. It's our money from the very get go. So it's good for that. It keeps the marriage communal. You want to get away from scorekeeping, who's contributing what. Um, that can really degrade a marriage. Um, and it just kind of prompts conversations and gets people on the same page about um, what are our goals and what are we trying to do. So it's good for that. Where joint accounts are not so good is if we both are just like keeping an eye on everyone's details, like line by line, like, oh my gosh, you spent this on that? Oh, what are you doing? So that's why I like separate accounts on the back end of a joint account. So we each get X dollars to spend per week or month or whatever of our money without scrutiny from the other person. So I, again, I just have a sense of what you're up to. I don't need the details. Um, so you can pursue your own individual passions and interests um, without someone watching over your shoulder. And I think that strikes a good balance of um, openness, but also some autonomy and individuality. So yeah, I love joint accounts as a, again, a money laundering tool, um, but again, I, I wouldn't want us kind of constantly spending out of that. Yes, we use that for like joint purchases, rent, mortgage, whatever, but our individual lives, yeah, there's a little separation there. Interesting. I wonder if it's harder for people, uh, you mentioned people marrying older, but I wonder if it's harder for people in a second marriage or in a, in a new long-term relationship after an old one uh, with existing financial patterns maybe your your new partner has different patterns so it sounds like there's there's a lot that needs to be hashed out as you get together no that's absolutely right and there is evidence that remarriages are more likely to just stay separate and i i get that and my approach is kind of risky like if the couple is on shaky ground i'm not sure i would recommend this approach i would say well let's see let's not go all in just yet so it is this constant tension in relationships, a choice between do you connect with the partner or do you protect yourself in case things go bad? And it's hard to do both at the same time. Um, so my approach leans more on the connect part and the, it is, so it's a little risky, um, but I completely understand that it's not for everyone and there are other considerations, um, but I, I, I come at this from like, let's maximize happiness. I'm assuming things are okay. Can we make it even better? That's kind of my 
mo- those are my couples. That's who I'm talking to first and foremost. Interesting. Well, you mentioned trust earlier, and you know, financial infidelity has become this this buzz buzzword. Uh, sometimes I think it it gets misused. It, it can be a weapon. But how do you define it, and what does it mean for money relationships between couples? Like even like before you get to that joint account stage, or or even after? Yeah. No, I, I, there does seem to be like some mild moral panic around financial infidelity. There's all these stories about how it's so common. And when I see how other people define it, I'm just aghast. Like it just seems, they seem to define it as anything short of complete proactive transparency um, equals financial infidelity. So if you um, go to the store and you pay for groceries and you withdraw $20 cash, you pay with debit, but you don't tell me that you took the cash. I'll just think you spent all that money on groceries. I won't realize you had a secret spending spree with that money. Um, That to me seems crazy. Um, So I think there are acts that could count as true financial infidelity. Um, If I tell you I sent in the check for the mortgage, but I did not, like if I'm actively trying to mislead you, okay, now that counts. But, um, you know, I... I hope, and there doesn't seem to be too much of that out there. Um, So I think, uh, you know, privacy and discretion can be good things. Uh, It's not infidelity. There are secrets that we each know that the other is keeping. You're not kind of handing me your credit card statement. I don't need to see it. Um, But yeah, it's, I think true financial infidelity is more rare than we've been led to believe. And the real spending that gets most couples in trouble is the spending that's right out in the open that we all know about the mortgage that we couldn't afford the remodel that we probably shouldn't have done or the new car that we couldn't afford. So it's, it's usually stuff that everyone knows about. Um, so I, yeah, there's too much worry. I think about financial infidelity. Oh, interesting. Well, one of the things that I think about sometimes is uh, on on the investing side. Sometimes uh, one partner is much more interested in investing than the other, and a lot of times that the partner that's interested in investing is way more uh, risk tolerant than the partner who's not interested in investing. So, it's not quite financial infidelity, but it does become a thing where like. I'm doing what's right for for us. You should be able to take the risk. And the other person is like, no, I don't want to do this. So how do you kind of resolve some of those tensions? Yeah. Um, You know, I would say in those cases, it's wonderful to get an outside perspective. And this can be a financial advisor, a trusted friend. Um, Yeah, it's, yeah, because you say it's, it's, it's hard to resolve who should you, who's, opinion should matter more there. Um, so that's where I like to get a, a different perspective. And hopefully that can help to break the log jam a bit. Um, so I, there I, I say, yeah, we got to talk to someone else instead of, cause you'll just like get caught in the, we should, no, we shouldn't. And yeah. Interesting. That makes sense. Well, we're, we're recording this uh, near Valentine's Day, and this is always this is the, this is one of those gifting landmines. This is like this is a this is worse than Christmas, in my opinion. So <laughs> you you talked earlier about uh, you know, tight Watson Spencer and kind of understanding each other's gifting language. So how do we how do we get through this holiday and and give appropriate gifts without causing ourselves uh, a little bit of pain? Yeah, well. First of all, I suggest don't ask the other person what they want because <laughs> never works. Can, well, yeah, and it can hurt their feelings. You can ask in like the night before, like, oh, you want something? Are we doing Valentine's this year? No, no. But really, the gift giving is a chance to show the person, oh, I see you. I know you. I understand you. And so, you know, giving a good gift, it takes time. You got to be curious about your partner and, and take time to learn about them and ask them kind of. What are they excited about? What are they worried about? What are they, um, you know, hopes and dreams, that kind of thing. So there's that. Um, also, I would say that a good gift requires sacrifice. I need to know that this wasn't super easy for you to find or think of or um, obtain. 
so I want to get the sense that you didn't just pick this up at CVS on your way home. So um, a spendthrift, if a spendthrift wants to sacrifice, it's not going to be through spending money. Because I know if I'm married to a spendthrift, I know they find spending money. It's no big deal. Oh, they get me an iPad. It's nice, but they just got themselves a new iPhone. They do this kind of stuff all the time. It's water off their back. So they have to do something that takes time and effort. They got to plan a weekend. They got to track down a rare Taylor Swift album autograph or something that is hard to find. They got to put in the effort. Um, a tightwad, it's a little different. If I know a tightwad doesn't like spending money and they spend a bunch of money, that's a sacrifice. They've endured something painful. Now, it still has to be a thoughtful gift. But for them, spending money can be a real act of self-sacrifice. Um, so yeah, I would just say, keep in mind, the gift will be interpreted based on what the recipient knows about you and how you approach money. So you have to kind of sacrifice accordingly. Hmm, interesting. I hadn't, I hadn't thought about it quite that way. <laughs> well, something I enjoyed about this, this book and in this conversation with you is you've talked a lot about your relationship. It sounds like you've done some thinking about your spending tendencies, uh, over the years and also research and writing this book. So how do you encourage people to kind of do, do that research on themselves in a, in a, in a way that's not too painful? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I actually think writing the book made me more of a spendthrift actually. Oh, whoops. <laughs> um, <laughs> is, no, is that I mean, the desired end outcome or no? It was, it was surprising, but um, yeah, it was just like, Another reminder, like, oh, yeah, life is kind of short and um, maybe err on the side of seizing opportunities for current happiness rather than hoping like, oh, maybe in a few decades we'll have a chance to go on this nice vacation. So I, nothing off the rails, just like a little more. Um, but no, I think it's good to kind of, again, take the scale or some other questionnaire, just explore yourself, explore it with your partner get outside perspectives, um, financial advisors. I like the Am I Rich calculator from the New York Times. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are some tightwads who see themselves as like really disadvantaged and in a bad spot. And then they take the calculator. It's like, oh, I'm rich, actually. Um, that can help to kind of, you know, loosen up your view. Um, so, yeah, it's just, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about money date nights. Um, you know, pairing it with something fun, um, like, oh, that's the night that we indulge. Like we're going to allow ourselves to order a takeout from like the best restaurant in town and, you know, pair a want with a should and that kind of temptation bundling that we talk about in behavioral science. Um, so yeah, try to, try to add some fun to it, some lightness, if at all possible. And just for goodness sakes, don't pour over the details of what the other person is spending. I mean, that should be available upon request, but hopefully the requests are few and far between. Um, there needs to be a little, uh, everyone needs a room of their own, so to speak. <laughs> so, so is the goal in, so we've talked about tight squads, we've talked about spendthrifts, we know there's the middle ground. Is the goal to get to the middle ground? And do you know, how does it, like, do we have more tight wads or spendthrifts sort of in the population as a whole? Yeah. Um, the distribution tends to be, if you average across all the places we've done this, about 25% tightwad, 25% spendthrift, 50% unconflicted. Oh, good. It does differ on where you look. Um, but uh, is the goal to be unconflicted? Yeah, I don't think it's a realistic goal. I, we don't find a lot of change over time. It's hard to change. But... I would say, particularly with mismatched spouses, the goal should be to, you know, moderate a little, come together a little bit. Um, that is a characteristic of a happy couple where they can pull each other in a little bit. Um, I think my wife and I, for example, are not as extreme as we were at the beginning. We both kind of fixed each other in a way. Um, so yes, it's uh yeah, the goal should be to, you know, if you're extreme, like, you know, tamp it down a little. Learn from a partner who who approaches things differently. But um, wholesale change is, is quite difficult. 
Moderation in all things. Well, sure. <laughs> Professor Rick, thank you so much for your time. The book is Tightwads and Then Thrifts. It's a great guide for un understanding your own financial habits. Thank you so much for having me. This was great.